evening, everyone. My name is Saunders Lee, and I'm the Public Program Coordinator here at the Right. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, our President and CEO, Ms. Juanita Moore, and staff here, to this great historical event honoring Dr. Melvin Pender, Jr. <laughs> to whom much is given, much is required, Dr. Melvin Pender, Jr. has spent many years making this motto a part of his lifestyle by giving back to his community. A native of Atlanta, a retired military officer, Olympian, entrepreneur, and community leader. Mel has made numerous contributions to his community. The construction of the first black pool in Linwood Park, the community where he grew up, was one of his first contributions. However, motivating youth is his passion and most significant contribution. His professional and life experiences provide the support from which he drives his message when addressing young audiences. His aim is to inspire and motivate youth to achieve their goals and to remember that once success is achieved, they must reach back and help another child succeed. Entering the U.S. Army at the age of 17, as an enlisted man, he served 11 years, then attended Officers Candidate School, where he became an officer. He served in the 9th Division, the Central Intelligence Agency, and as a commanding officer in the 1982nd Airborne Division. Captain Pender was assigned two tours in Vietnam, and after serving 21 years in the military, he retired in 1976. Among numerous medals and badges, the most distinguished awards were the Brown Star, the Vietnam Service Medal, the Combat Infantry Badge, the Meritorious Service Medal, and the Joint Service Commendation Medal. At age 25, while playing football on the Army team, he discovered his natural talent was track and field. His career as a world-class athlete began while still maintaining his position in the military. To date, Mel holds the world record in the 50 and 60 yard dash. He once held world records in the 70 and 100 yard dash and the 100 meter dash. In 1964, at the age of 27, he competed in the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo. Mel was pulled out of combat in Vietnam to complete the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, where he won the gold medal in the 4x100 meter relay at 31. He was the oldest sprinter to compete in the 100 meter relay. He was pulled again from Vietnam for the 1972 Olympic trials. Injuring himself, he didn't make the team. Following his Olympic endeavor, Mel was offered several professional football contracts, but turned them down to continue his military career. From 1970 to 1976, he served his last six years at West Point Military Academy as the first black coach of track and field. During 1972 to 1975, while coaching at West Point, Mel worked very hard to complete his education, traveling over 100 miles daily to Adelphi University. In 1976, Mel earned a BA degree in social science with honors and ran professional track for the International Track Association concurrently. He set the world record in the 1960-yard dash at the age of 35 years old and at the time of 5.8 seconds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor, honor to introduce Dr. Melvin Pender, Jr. Um, you know, I, I like to think um, 
be staffed at uh, the Charles Wright Museum for all the hard work they did to set up this this affair this afternoon, this evening. And I'd like to thank uh, my lovely wife, my preacher wife. Yeah, she's a preacher, boy. She can preach. Amen. Yeah, um, for all the work and hard work she's done to make this make this happen also. Let us see how pretty she is. Her name is Reverend Debbie Preacher Pender. But, uh, you know, my life has been somewhat like a fairy tale. And when I came here last year uh, as a speaker, when I walked through that museum, this museum here, it took something, I uh, did something inside of me uh, because I grew up in the 30s. I was born October 31st, 1937. I'll be 80 next month. Do I look good, y'all? Yeah. yeah. I didn't clap loud enough. You got a good wife. <laughs> yes. I got a good wife. You know what to say. Right. Uh, but um, when I came, when I, when I walked through that, this museum, and, and, and I think about all the hard work and all the um, uh, things that people before me uh, made it happen for me to be the person I am today. Um, it, all the things that, the suffering uh, that people, uh, black people went through to vote, uh, to get equal rights in America. You know, we live in a, I, you know, I, I, I always like to say that we live in the greatest country in the world, but you know, I'm not gonna say that. This is a great country, but still we have segregated schools. We still have segregated communities. We still have, uh, in the military, we still have uh, diversity in the military. And, and I used to ask my mother why when I was a kid, the things I used to see when I was maybe eight, nine years old, the troop trains in Atlanta, I mean in Dalton, Georgia, would stop on the tracks on their way to the Second World War and the white troops on the front of the train and the black troops on the back of the train. And I would go home and I asked my mother, why? And my sister would get angry with me because I'm always asking my mother, why? The word why always came out of my heart because I said, we go to different schools. Why do we have to go to different schools, Mom? I said, why? And I said, we all people. We bleed one color, that's red. God made us all the same. He didn't make us no different. He didn't make me different than you. Only thing he did was make my color a little different than other nationalities. But he made us people. We're all God's children. And as I go through, before I go any further, let me introduce some friends of mine. First, I want to introduce um, my, my uh, mother-in-law and his wife, uh, the Studers. Will you please stand up, please? Doug Studer. And I have uh, someone here that is like really, really my brother and my sister. That's Mr. And Mrs. Doctor, Mrs. And Mrs. Tom Hill, and her and her twin sister Billy. Would you please stand up? I mean Bobby. They're gonna kill me because I get them mixed up. You look at them. Can you tell them apart? You can't tell them apart. Well, they, they played a trick on me one time. I was at West Point. I had had surgery. And um, they came to see me, and Billy sent Bobby into the room first. And I thought it was Billy. And I still can't hardly tell them apart. Even though I'm a godson of their boys. But still, it's hard for me, when they're together, it, I, it's embarrassing because I'm sorry, but you're both beautiful, okay? Uh, I have another friend uh, um, here. Uh, he played football with Detroit, and and his and his lovely wife is a twin sister of Ray Brown that played for the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Falcons. Will you please stand up, please? I I fit your first name. I'm sorry. Chris, that's right. I'm sorry, Chris. Excuse me. I'm getting old, man. All right. Michael, will you please stand up? Michael uh, is an old friend of mine, and this. 
owner from Chicago, Illinois. And I have Lou Scott, my teammate. Lou Scott. And, uh, and, and the great Al Jones, will you stand up Al Jones? Yeah. The great Al Jones, who was a boxer in 1968 Olympics. These are two guys that are really brothers uh, because what we went through in 1968, uh, people don't really know the story. And there's another lady sitting here uh, that her husband was my best friend uh, in the military and also in the Olympic Games. That's June Drayton, Paul Drayton's wife. Paul Drayton's a two-time gold medal winner in 1968 Olympics. Went to Villanova. Please stand up, sweetheart. Uh, and Lou's lovely wife, I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Jones, you want to stand up too? I'm sorry I didn't introduce you. You lovely lady, you, I tell you. Yeah. Um, it's good to have people that travel long distance to honor you, to, to know that you have friends. And friends to me is very, very important. Uh, Billy and Tom has been like, is, is family to me. And I, I'm so glad they came over from Texas. Wow. From Texas. And Tom, is, Tom just retired from Iowa State. He's a professor. He was one of the first black coaches at West Point Military Academy. Right. Tom is a very, very intelligent young man. He's like a son, but um, he looks older than me. Look older than me but, but, um, <laughs> but let me get back to the road that I travel in my life. I know God had a mission for me. Even when I was a little boy, because I was, like I said, I was very sensitive about a lot of things around me. And I would see airplanes flying over Dalton, Georgia. And back then, you didn't see many airplanes, because there wasn't that many. And I always wanted to be a pilot. And then I would go to the, I would go to the movie on Saturdays, and I would see this movie. I saw this movie called To Hell and Back by Audie Murphy. You old folks know who that is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, Audie Murphy was short in stature like me, but he didn't look good as me. <laughs> but uh, I want to be just like Audie Murphy. Right. Audie Murphy, father left him, left his family, I think it's a family of like eight to 10. He left, his father one day went to work, never came back. So Artie joined, Artie Murphy joined the military and Artie, uh, was an army ranger. He, he came out and won all kind of medals. So when I was a kid, you, you, you see these movies, uh, and the only way you could see the movies about the war was go to the movie on Saturdays. The old folks know what I'm talking about. We didn't have television. And I would go to the movies, and, and I always wanted to see, see if I could see my dad. My dad was in the Navy. And I was only like seven, eight years old when he went in in 1943. 1943, he went in the military. <coughs> And I never saw any black troops. I said, now, wait a minute. We got black soldiers fighting this war. Where in the hell are they? But we had the triple nickel. We have the Tuskegee Airmen. Until just recently, in the last couple of, say, three or four years, they had a movie like Tuskegee Airmen. Some of the greatest pilots in the history of the Air Force, Air, Army Air Corps. But all these things that I would see as a kid, being as sensitive as I was, I want to be do something great with my life. I want to be in the military. I want to make my mother proud of me. I want to make her proud. She was working making $15 a week. And when, she, when she'd come home, she'd be so tired, and she always liked my, my, my sister to comb her hair. And I would get a pail of water and put vinegar in that water. Because back then, you'd get pedicures. You did your pedicure with vinegar and water. Now, you probably don't know about that, but that's the way black folks did it, okay? And she, she would work so hard, and I had to be the man of the house when the father was in the Navy, but I never forget those days. And when you get older, you start reminiscing about life. And I have gone back since I've gotten older, and I start thinking about a lot of things that happened in my life. 
and how some of the good things and the bad things, things that, 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 that were sad, things that I cried about, things that scared the hell out of me, and things that I didn't think I would ever come home again during the war. But as a kid, I know that I had to do something to make my mother proud of me. I didn't know that one day I would be a world-class sprinter. I didn't know that. Now I'm going to probably skip around a little bit. But not until I was 25 years old did I ran my first track meet in Okinawa. The 82nd Airborne Division was sent to Okinawa getting ready for Vietnam. We was the only airborne unit on the, in Okinawa at Sukaran Base, Air Base. And I was training, and one day I was asked to go play football. And the um, football coach saw me run. He said, I've never seen anybody as fast as you. And a Japanese Olympic team came over from Osaka, Japan, training for the 1964 games. And he said, I want you to run against these Japanese. They wanted some Americans to participate. And I said, I know anything about track. I know anything. I ain't no Jesse Owens. That's, that's the time gullible I was. So he said, go get some track shoes and some shorts, and I'll pick you up, and I'll take you down to Nongo. So he said, watch the Japanese. Everything you do, you do. I said, OK, coach. This is the football coach. And um, I dug two holes in the ground. Gun went off, and I said, oh, hell, I guess I better go. <laughs> I had me down the track, I caught the guy, and I won my first track meet. And that's how I got involved in track and field. I was, in, I was the Pacific champion in Okinawa, and they sent me to seven days R&R &R in Yokohama, Japan. And that's when I saw all the building for the Japanese Olympics. And at the time, I met this Japanese girl. My wife knows about this. <laughs> Her name was Yokomo, uh, Monaco Yokomoto. Is that my baby? She knows everything. I have a name was Monaco Yokomoto. She was absolutely gorgeous. I said, I got to come back to the Olympics. And I'd be damned if I didn't make the Olympic team. And I got to see Monaco again. But, you know, I got hurt, and I got hurt in, in, in um, 1964. And I like to tell the story because. Bob Hayes was the number one sprinter in the world. And I was like number two, and, 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 and Trenton Jackson was the other guy from Rochester, New York. I was number three. And of course, we were running against and beating each other. So he punched me in my ribcase, just playing around. And I went out to run my first race, and I could feel something kind of tear in my rib. And so I went to see the doctor the next day. He said, you can't run. He said, you got torn muscles in your ribcage and said, you're going to have internal bleeding if you keep running. He said, I said, I can't give you injections in your stomach. I can give them in, in your back, along the, along the spine. So I said, shoot me, doc. <laughs> I'm going to run. I played six in the 100 meters. I didn't get the last. I played six in the 100 meters. And I wasn't able to run the relay. Now, I was 27 years old, the oldest sprinter in the history of track and field back then to run as fast as I ran. So I thought my time was over in track and field. My days were over running. But the news meter and the reporter said, well, I guess Mel's days are over in track and field. He's 27 years old and won't be able to do it again. So I said, watch my smoke. So I went back to 82nd Airborne Division, took a test for Officer Candy School, went to Officer Candy School and Fort Riley, Kansas, six months to Fort Riley, Kansas, straight to Vietnam, 9th Division, Mekong Delta. One of the worst. <coughs> combat area in Vietnam. In my unit, there was kids 18 to 22 years old. I was 28. Now, I'm going to get off the beaten path. Let me say something about that. I don't like really talking about Vietnam because I get a little choked up about it. I said we live in the greatest country in the world. And I say that, and I used to say it all the time, but what I'm saying now in the, with our government, it breaks my heart. Because I think about all the young men that died for this country in Vietnam, and this bullshit that's going on right now in this country is bringing slavery and discrimination back in America.
say this because I speak from I speak my mind and I, and I speak from my heart. I had a young white kid die in my arms in Vietnam. He wasn't black. He wasn't. Chinese, he was an Indian, he was a human being. He was an American. This kid died in my arms. You know, and I think I start thinking about when I go home, what am I doing here? Because when I go back home, am I free? Am I gonna be treated like an American, a human being? Am I going to be treated because of the color of my skin? Why am I here? But this thing that's happening here in America right now is bringing us back to the 50s. God made us all one people. We may be different colors. We may have different hair. We walk the same. We not look the same. But God made us one people. Until we learn how to come together as one people in this country, we will not survive. With this crazy guy in Korea, and it's in, 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 in China and Russia. Don't ever say that it cannot land here on this country. If you've never seen war, you've never seen people die, don't even damn try to talk about it because you don't know what you're talking about. I've seen death. I've seen starvation. I've seen so much in my life. And as I get older, all of it comes back to me. I've had seven operations. I fought prostate cancer. I'm fighting leukemia right now, of age of orange. I had back surgery, I had neck surgery. I had hip replacement. I had two bones taken out of both of my wrists. But I'm here. Because God had me on mission. He had me on a mission. I'm still on that mission. I'm still on that path where he put me on when I was young. When I was first 17 years old, when I promised my mom that one day I was gonna make her proud of me. I'm telling you people, America, we are one people. And now I know People sitting in the audience, and I hear people saying, "Well, I don't watch the news because I'm not concerned with all this stuff that's happening on the news." Well, you better get concerned. Yeah. You saw 9/11, didn't you? Yeah. Don't you think that you think they can't come here? Yeah. If you've never been in the military, you can't sit there and you can't talk about it because you don't know you don't know anything you're talking about. But until you see what's happening in this country, not only with the, what the other countries around the world is doing, you look at KKK and the white supremacists. What happened in in, 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 in Virginia, you don't know it might be a civil, might be a racial war in America. So you better get concerned. You better start thinking about it. You better start coming together as one people, black and white, Chinese, Japanese, you better start trying to come together because if we ever have a war in this country, everybody's going to be fighting for the same cause to stay alive. Now, I didn't mean to get deep into that. But when I start talking about Vietnam, it brings back memories. It brings back heartache. It, it brings back pain. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I stand here today 
as a Christian. I stand here as a God, as a God's man. I'm a man of God. I stand here as a black man that knows that know who I am. I know who the hell I am. I'm a black American. I'm a black man in America. I'm an American. And I almost died for this country. And I would die for this country today. But what I have been seeing and hearing in the last year, now six months, or eight months, it has really torn, torn me apart because I cannot believe what I'm seeing and hearing. My wife and I have six children, okay, between us. We have nine great kids and one great grandchild. And today, sometimes we wonder what happens to our children. Not that they're bad children, but sometimes they forget where they come from. And it's kind of heartbreaking. It's, it's a thing where you wonder all the things that you try to do to make them better people, or make them be good citizens in America. You wonder what happened to them. Now, I'm not saying my kids are drug addicts. They're not that. But I, I hear other families talking about their children. But kids need to know their heritage. That's right. They need to walk into this museum right here. Yeah, right, right. Walk through these halls and these different areas in this museum. Then they would know where they came from. They would know the people that gave their lives for them to be who they are and to be free in America. What I see, what I've seen here in America, in this museum, brought back a lot of memories of my grandfather's stories about slavery. About his father and his father's father. About him having a, and couldn't go to school and had to apply f and, 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 and the farms and, and the crops, raise crops for, for the white man. <coughs> but you know what my grandfather told me? He said, you hate no one. If you take the word hate out of your vocabulary, he said, you love everybody because you cannot change the way that people feel about certain things. He said, you have to make them try to understand. I have lived my life loving everybody, all people. My grandfather told me one day, he said, listen. He said, read. He said, do your arithmetic. Now, I lived by that. I lived by that all my life. And at 80 years old, I still live by it. I still listen. I listen to things around me, and I try to, try to understand things that I don't actually, you know, don't understand when I, when I see certain things and I hear certain things. And when I see so much stuff going around today and we're losing so many young black men, in prisons and dying and killing each other. When I see the police brutality, as well as even when I was a kid, it's still happening. It happened back in the 50s. It happened back in the 30s. I, you know, I've seen it, and it's still happening. So what can we do about that? I was just talking today about have a leader in this country. We don't have a, a black leader like Martin Luther King. Until we find somebody that can help, have black people that can stand behind and help try to break up some of this crazy stuff that's going on with the killing of young people, we always gonna have that problem in America. I, I just, sometimes I, I, I sit and I sit and I, 
And I think about the things, again, that, I, that, that I've seen, that I've seen growing up at my age, 80 years old, and some of them still have. It hurts. 1968, John Carlson, Tommy Smith did the, what's it called? Yeah. Solid gesture. Lou Scott, yes, Al, yes, it wasn't a black power salute yes, because so many people misunderstand things that, that I mean, they don't want to make things out of a mountain of a mobile, the news, the news media did. What it said was, we are black people. We are black athletes representing our country, United States of America. We're here to win gold medals for America, not just for one people, not for black people, for all people in America. But they took it the wrong way. They crucified those two guys. But now they're doing well. Praise the Lord. They're doing well. But John Collins and Thomas Smith suffered because people misunderstood them. Until we learn how to understand each other, ladies and gentlemen, we're always going to have the problem that we have right now. Now, I kind of got off the beaten path of what I was going to say about my speech, but it was a thing when I walked through that museum again there with my wife. It just did something to me again. Because last time I was here, I was so impressed with it, I said I was going to give my medal to this museum. And I was asked why would you give your medal to the Charles Wright Museum? How can I not? They said, why don't you give it to Washington, D.C., the new museum in Washington? Why don't you give it to the one in Atlanta? I said, you need to go to Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. I said, you just need to walk through that museum. And then you see why I donated my gold medal. The medal is worth $150,000. All right. And right now the shoes are just something they say worth 50000 because of the 1968 games. But it's not about the money. It's not about the, the money. It's about history. Yes. yes, sir. It's about kids knowing history. There's so much history in this museum, in this country, about black people that people don't know about. That's history in this room. That's Tom Hill sitting right there, that's history. That's Lou Scott sitting here in that school. That's Al Jones sitting here, that's history. People don't know the history. In 1968, they don't know what we went through. We were called boy. Yeah, if you do anything, we're not damn boys, I'm a damn man. That's right. But you ever call me a damn boy? If those boys demonstrate, we're going to send them home. I said, you're not going to send me no damn way. I just got out of Vietnam. They don't know I know karate. <laughs> said, they don't know I'm a black belt. I got called boy and all kind of names when I was a kid. But call me boy now, you don't get hurt. Because my wife said, I cut you. I shoot you. I bite your ear off. <laughs> but they call us boys, right, Lou? Yes, they call us boys. Little boys. Avis Brunswick. Yes, sir. Racist dude I ever known in my life. 19, he did 1936 like the same thing to Jesse Owens. He was the same one that's going to call us boy. Boys didn't die. Then when boys died in Vietnam. They were men. Boy. In my life, I have had so many things happen to me. I remember one time when I came back from 1968 Olympics, I came home, was taking my mother to the dock. And my mother from the old school. I had to go to the alley to go into a back door to take my mother to this doctor. Walked in this little area, and there was a little table with two chairs on the side. I said, Mom, what are we doing back here? She said, this is what we have to say. I said, no, we don't. I said, no, we don't. So I go up to the reception desk and I said, I'm here. My mother's here to see the doctor. Well, you know, that's why y'all supposed to y'all, y'all, y'all supposed to sit up there, back there. Y'all don't come up here. I said, y'all don't. 
I said, no, I'm not sitting back here. My mother's not sitting back here either. So she go get the doctor. He's going he to threaten me. He don't know I just got back to Vietnam. Tom Hill, they didn't know me, did it? Huh? He didn't know me, did it? I said, if you open your mouth one more time, you won't speak again. And my mother was crying. I was crying. And I almost broke my hand hitting the stern when I got back in the car. I took my mother and left. Well, another story. In my uniform in 19... 63, 82nd Airborne, Morgan State University. Me and this uh, white guy was uh, a good friend of mine, 82nd Airborne, went to a run in my first track in the United States in Morgan State. I'm airborne sharp. I mean, clean. We go into this restaurant, and he said, let's get a hamburger. I walk in the restaurant, and the lady says, he can't come in here. I'm in my uniform. I can't come in here. Another story. On my way to Fort, Bra Fort Jackson, South Carolina. They stopped in Athens, Georgia. And there was black and white fountains and black and white toilets. I didn't get off the bus. I must peed on myself. Before I got to Fort Jackson. Want to hear another story? I can keep going. I can keep going. West Point Military Academy, Tom Hill, right there, first black coach in West Point, told me they weren't ready for a head black coach. Am I right, Tom? Yeah. Mm. This is the West Point Military Academy. Tom, we were the best season they ever had at West Point, am I right? And the coach had been there 25 years because of the color of my skin. You want to hear some more? I won't go anymore. But I can tell you these stories. I can tell you all the things that, that I've been through in my life. But look at me. I don't cuss nobody out. I'm not going to hit you because you call me a name, but don't put your hands on me. I'm married to a white woman. <laughs> See it right there? That's a woman. That is not, I'm looking at her being white. She's a woman. Her blood runs red, just like mine. And the best thing ever happened to me is this woman sitting right there. All the sickness I've gone through, all the operations I've gone through, taking care of my mother until she died at 96. That woman, right there. My father died at 94. That woman, right there. Her mother, that woman, was traveling back and forth Atlanta to, to um, Minnesota, to see about her parents, her mother, that woman. She didn't do it because of the color of her skin. She did it because she's a woman. She's a God's child. She's a, she, 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 she loves God, and God is in her life. I, you know, I just, I'm sitting here reminiscing because I'm going to reminisce because if you don't like it, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I'm speaking from my heart, people. I'm skipping around, but I'm speaking for what I feel as I stand here. I'm feeling how I feel right now. This is how I feel. It's coming out of me now, how I feel. Because I don't have much time left. Years are getting short for me, and I know that. When we wrote this book, my wife and I wrote this book. And it was her and to encourage me to write this book. For her to write it, all I did was talk. She said, you need to write a book about your life. And I had a lot of friends say the same thing to me. You need to write a book about your life. And all the things that you've gone through in your life, the things you have, things you have done, you need to let people know. So we wrote the book. It took us five years from, to write this book from all the, her going to college, getting her degree in psychology, taking care of me and my mom, dad, her mother. We finished the book. And it's a good book. I'm saying it's a good book. 
We're on our way to Savannah when it clears up down there to do a documentary. On me. Yes, I'm proud of me. I mean, I give me think I'm bragging, but I am bragging. I'm damn proud of me. We as a black man in America have to work so damn hard to survive. When I say survive, we can't get the jobs that other nationalities get. And you know that. I'm sitting here and you shake your head. You know what I'm talking about. I'm thinking my mind. You don't like it. I'm sorry. We have to survive in this country. We all don't get the good jobs. We got people suffering right now because they can't get good jobs, because they color their skin. We got kids in our communities don't know nothing about their heritage. They don't know where they come from. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't need to come here. They need to come right here, and I guarantee you they'll change. As Martin Luther King, that C.T. Williams, they don't know who these people are. They don't know the people that marched in Alabama, that died and gave their life and got jailed. They don't, they don't know the history. Not only black people, kids should know, but white kids should know. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you know, I, like I said, I, this is the first time anybody have done that, but <laughs> I, I just got to feel like when I'm in here, I got off script, but I just feel like saying what I want to say from my heart. Yes, <laughs> Atlanta Falcons. Well, uh, thank you for your service, and I just wanted to um, mention that we have something else in common. You know, my father was in the Air Force, and I went to middle school in Okinawa, Japan, Kadena. So that's one thing I want to share with you here. But I, wanted, I was struck by your comments about Vietnam and uh, the episode of the young men dying in your arms. And you said that you never hated anyone. But at that moment in the war, did you ever have hate for the enemy? And if so, how did you deal with it over the years? I didn't hate the enemy. We had no business there. That's right. And they were defending their country. That's right. That's right. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know whether you saw a documentary that's been on TV about Vietnam the last couple of days. Yes, it's on PBS. PBS. Yeah. Yeah. We never should have been in that war because Ho Chi Minh sent two letters to President Kennedy. He never got them. If you see that documentary, you need to see that documentary. He never got the letters that he sent to Kennedy. Said that you know something about he uh, he liked the way that uh, America lives. In other words, I can't tell you exactly what he said, but if these letters would have stopped, I think the war. We had, we had no business in Vietnam whatsoever. We lost 50, over 50,000 young men in Vietnam. 57,000. 57,000. And they were sending black kids over there. You don't know. We don't stop that, Jesse Jackson. You don't know that story either, do you? They were sending a lot of black kids in rural areas to Vietnam. That's right. That's the military. Uh, Mr. Printer, first of all, thank you for your services to a grateful nation. Like yourself, I'm an awesome vet, honorably discharged vet, but I was in the Navy. And I lived in Japan, in South Japan, that's in the northern part of the Islands. My question to you is, <clears throat> how do we address the educational inadequacy in our community so we can bridge that gap in income disparity? Thank you. You know I should have up here right and answer that question. Dr. Hill. 
Now, Dr. Hill can answer that question really well. <laughs> How are we going to do that? I don't know. It's hard for me to say. And Hill, uh, Dr. Hill, will you get up there, please, and tell me what you think? Yes. Well, I, what I can do is, is give you uh, one person's perspective as an educator. Um, we've got to, as Mel said, get our kids to understand and know what their heritage is, what their history is. That's, that's where it starts. If, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. You're not going to know where you're going. So that's, that's really, really critical. The other thing we must do is we must come together as a village and support the kids. And the village also means parents getting involved. That's right. You don't send your school, your kids to school. You go to school with them. And and, and that's Mel, I really believe that's a that's a critical part. And uh, being being a young officer, I was uh, I was a second lieutenant, Mel was a captain, and Mel mentored me. And as he was doing his thing, he was the source of motivation. And however old he was, old was very back then, but <laughs> however old he was, he was still had a passion for getting an education. He's part of responsibility for me having a PhD today. He served at that, as that source of motivation. All right. and, uh, and so, now for me, that would be what I would start with, that we have to not talk about how bad our kids are, not talk about what they're not doing, but show them what to do and how to do it. And my question, I'm gonna sit down, my question to you was, piggybacking on a previous question, what advice would you give to us for dealing with, with what we've been dealing with over the last 50, 60, 70 years? We're still taking down Confederate statues. I mean, we're, we're still dealing with white supremacy. What advice would you give us to deal with what we're dealing with today? Thanks. But that's a good question, Tom. Um, again, you know, I keep saying that we as people have to come together. My race of people have to come together, Tom. We have a big problem with our own race. And so we come together as one people. We need to, that's the way we can stop. We need a leader too, Tom. We need, we need somebody like Martin Luther King to lead us. We don't have a leader. And we got all these businesses making all this money in all these big churches. What in the hell are they doing? You sit there on Sunday, you look on TV on Sunday, and there's thousands of people sitting in the church. And these ministers wearing diamond rings and bodyguards and driving airplanes, and what are they doing? You ever see them out there on the street? No. You don't see them on the street, do you? No. All they care about is themselves. Right. Until we find somebody that can lead our people, Tom, we're always going to be in the position we're in today. Amen. We, as people in general, need to come together. Not just black folks, white folks, and black folks need to come together. We need to come and stop thinking we better than anybody else. White folks are no better than black people. This country is made up of all people. Indians, Japanese, blacks. This country is made up of all. And you know, Anglo-Saxons didn't make America. Now this is, what, this is what my, you know what, this is what my boss told me one day. He called me in his office and said, Mel, understand you're dating a woman that's not black. Now, he don't know I want to slap the shit out of him. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to say that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Tom? But anyway, <clears throat> now, he called me in because he said his wife was dating his, I mean, his daughter was dating a Chicano. She was going to the University of Texas, Thomas. 
and his wife was Anglo-Saxon American. I said, what in the hell they got to do with Mel Pender? I said, furthermore, I'm not dating a white woman. And furthermore, ain't your damn business who I date. That's right. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on even in the military. I mean, the thing they tried to do to me at West Point, Tom, he was there. Just to keep me from having that head coach, they tried to play Tom against me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, Tom? Oh, what's gonna happen? Oh, I wasn't married and had two kids stationed back in a dog. I was single. I drove Jaguars, Corvettes, <laughs> dressed like I'm dressed now. I dated, you know. But it was a thing where we did our job at the right time. We did our job. That color has nothing to do with it. Don't you think that hurt? Can you imagine how I felt when somebody would say that to me? Inside of me, I mean, that hurt me. I've been to Vietnam, won all these medals. I've been, I won gold medals in the Olympics. I, I got all these awards from all over the country. I'm in, I'm going, I have 11, I'm in 11 Hall of Fames. Can you believe that shit? <laughs> and about to get involved, and, 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 and but to, I'm about to be inducted to my 12th Hall of Fame on the uh, 2nd of uh, November, right, honey? 12. But they want to treat me like I'm some, what do I want to say? Nobody. Because the color of my skin. Why? I've done all these things for my country to make my country look good, to make me look good, to make my family look good, but still. They wanted to treat me like I'm somebody from another country, another world, or another place. Some foreign country. I don't know what they wanted to do. But see, I let them do that at the time. I let them do it at the time. I was too intelligent to let them do that to me. I didn't curse and raise hell at a time. I said, okay. Like I say to my wife, yes, dear. <laughs> Do what you want to do to me. Say what you want to say to me, but don't touch me. So somebody gonna get hurt. Is that right, Thomas? Right. <laughs> I've been through the mountaintop. Anybody else? Don't be scared. <laughs> now, as your teammate at the 1968 Olympics, uh, I just want to know how you felt running among those uh, great sprinters as well as you were. How did I feel? How did you feel? Damn good. <laughs> but see, a lot of people don't know, I was like almost 10 years older than everybody I ran against. And I had to do extra training. And I don't know where you have seen some of the pictures of this beautiful body I had. <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I was on the weight, I was doing weight training three times a week. I was on the weights all the time. I had my little secret workouts in the afternoon, Lou, that people didn't know about. You understand what I'm saying? You had them too, Lou. Yes, sir. <laughs> I had my little secret workouts. Because at 31 years old, you just don't come back at my age to run as fast as I ran, setting world records like I did. I mean, out of Vietnam, out of combat, out of the jungles of Vietnam, fighting and coming back within a year of making the Olympic team, running against some of the top runners in the world. I was bad, y'all. Yes, you were. <laughs> now, I know that was the last question. I just want to say, look, I like to have fun. I like to joke. And I can get serious. And I can, you know, I, I can, you know, I can have fun. But I want you, what I've said to you today, I hope you didn't take it the wrong way. I hope you felt like what I was saying to you was coming from my heart. Yeah. And, and I want to thank again the Charles Wright Museum for letting me place my shoes and my gold medal, which means so much to me, in this museum here in Detroit, Michigan. Thank you so much.
like to remind everyone we'll be having a book signing until 9 p.m. Expression of Hope, the Mel Pender story. Right there at the bookstore. And now I'm going to give it to Miss Petrina Chapman. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes, Good evening. another round. Now, one thing I have to say is, um, I, I must say, is that historically, people have learned through stories. And he has shared so many stories with us this evening. And, and it's a great learning experience. It's one thing to read things in books. It's another thing to receive the information from the horses' mouths. Yeah. So again, thank you. My name is Katrina Chapman. I'm the curator of collections of exhibitions and co and, uh, uh, curator of collections and exhibitions. And of course, we're gathered here this evening to celebrate and thank Mr. Melvin Pender and his beautiful wife, Debbie, for choosing the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History as the repository for two of their family treasures. On behalf of the board of directors, administrators, staff, volunteers, and patrons of this institution, we thank you and your family for the extraordinary donation of your 1968 gold Olympic track cleats. I almost said shoes, but I guess the right term is cleats. <laughs> and the replica of your 4 by 100 meter Olympic gold medal. Your gifts will be added to the museum's permanent collection, which also, by the way, includes the Olympic track shoes of Detroit's own 1932 Olympic gold winner, Eddie Tolan. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pender, Pender, your donation will be preserved for generations to come. Moreover, your donation will help demonstrate how African Americans overcame, overcame inequality, discrimination, and racism to represent their country and to excel in sports on the world stage. Again, thank you. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, again, thank you for this generous gift. We rely on donations such as yours to support our ongoing effort to preserve our communal history. Thank you. And we now have unveil the wonderful gift. Close again, they're extraordinary. All right. Thank you, everyone.